All right, guys and girls, let's learn about momentum today. Momentum is really useful, and it's a very, very, very big idea in physics because it allows us to analyze systems of objects. So systems is the key thing here today. And what a system means is that it's two or more things or objects which are interacting with each other. Now, what's a system and what's an object? A lot of times is dependent on your point of view. So for um, example, we typically treat something like a tennis ball that's like solid as an object, even though it could be made out of parts. Same thing with a system. We could treat a system as being one thing separately, or we could treat it as multiple things which are interacting. It's the second definition, multiple things that are interacting, that is going to be most important to us here. So let's kind of get into it. The term momentum. Um, is a fancy word that we give to the quote-unquote quantity of motion. Like the momentum of something is how much motion it has or possesses. And that depends on two factors, namely its mass and its velocity. And so the more mass something has and the more velocity something has, the more momentum it has. The symbol that we use for momentum is a lowercase p. Now we can't use an M for momentum because we already used an M for mass. Um, I don't really know why we ended up on a lowercase p. That's just the, the standard. And so we can write a simple equation for momentum, like P equals M times V. But then we have to remember that V is a vector. Velocity is a vector quantity, meaning that the direction is important. And so that means that momentum is a vector quantity as well. So whenever we write a P for momentum, it's really important we put the vector arrow over it. That'll help us from getting that P for momentum confused with other P's that we may need to use. The unit for momentum is the unit for mass, which is kilogram, times the unit for velocity, which is a meter per second. And so behind um, a number for momentum, we would write kilogram meters per second. You would think, since that's a really complicated unit, that that would be one of those units that we named after somebody important. But it's really not named after anybody important. And so I decided to go ahead and name it after myself. So you can, in my class, refer to this as being a mark. You'll still write it like that, but you can call it a mark just to make it a shorter um, thing to call it. The momentum of a system of objects regardless of how many objects there are, is simply the vector sum of all the momentums of the individual objects. Keyword in there being vector. Remember that vectors have directions, so there's a difference between two objects that are moving in the same direction versus two objects that are moving opposite directions. So it's really, really important that we remember the signs. So let's take a simple system. Let's say we have two carts which are moving towards each other like this, kind of like what we did in our lab yesterday, um, and figure out the momentum of that system. Well, if we find the momentum of, oh, I'm going to make right be the positive direction. If we find the momentum of the blue cart by multiplying its mass times velocity, we would get something like 2 marks. And if we do the same thing for the red cart, we would get something like 3 marks. But since it's going in the negative direction, we need to give that momentum a negative sign. And so if we add those two together, both those numbers are in the x direction, so I can just add them together, making sure we remember that the 3 is negative, we would get something like negative 1 mark, or more correctly, we should say 1 mark going to the left. So remember that momentum, we need to include the direction since it's a vector. And so that's the momentum of that system of objects, and as it turns out, that's a really important number. And it's important because momentum is conserved. If you have a system that doesn't have any external forces acting on it, so like nothing from the outside exerts a force on objects that are within the system, then the momentum of the system is going to remain constant. And so we call such a system a closed system. Closed means there's no forces um, that aren't part of the system. And when that's true, then we say that the momentum of the system is conserved. So conserved, if you don't know the meaning, you should write it down, means to stay constant. 
That's what conserved means. It doesn't mean to save. It means to remain constant. Now, don't conf get confused. Things that are inside the system can gain or lose momentum as they interact with other objects that are part of the system, but the total is going to remain the same. So the momentum of an individual object can change, but the momentum of the system does not. It's a very, very important distinction. So let's take that same system that we were just dealing with, those two cars. They're moving towards each other. And suppose we let them collide, and we let them collide such that they stuck together. So kind of thinking back to the lab we did last time, that would be where the cars collided with the Velcro ends facing each other. So the momentum of this system we've calculated a minute ago is negative one mark, or one mark to the left. And so after they collided, we would expect them to be moving to the left. The red cart's got more momentum initially than the blue cart. And so when they stuck together, we'd expect them to move to the left. The thing we have to realize is that this number, the momentum of the system, does not change it's still going to be negative one mark. So if we've got the equation for momentum and we solve it for velocity, just divide both sides by the mass, then we can get an equation for V, and then we've got to realize that that one object, those two things stuck together now, has a mass of one and a half kilograms, and it's got a momentum of negative one mark, meaning that its velocity will be negative 0.67 meters per second. The kilograms cancels out. Or more correctly, we should say 0.67 meters per second going to the left. So the big idea here is that we can figure out what's happening during any interaction between multiple objects by making those objects a system and then realizing that this number, I don't know how many different ways to highlight it, doesn't change. So let's look at a second example. Suppose instead of sticking together, same system by the way, we let these two cards bounce apart. And in order to figure out what one card does, we would have to measure what um, the second card does. So let's say that they bounce a apart such that afterwards the red card moves to the left still, but it slows down to 0.5 meters per second. And we want to figure out, well, what is the blue card doing? I'm going to guess that it's going to be moving to the left, since the red car is moving to the left afterwards. So I'm going to go ahead and draw an arrow to the left and represent that velocity, and that's what we want to try to find. The momentum of this system is still negative one mark. And so down here, I can use that to figure out how much momentum the blue card has. So calculating the momentum of the red cart would give you negative 0.5 marks. And then I can find the momentum of the blue cart by realizing that they have to still add up to negative 1. So it's really important that we just write a simple equation like this. Basically what I've said here is that the momentum of the blue cart plus the momentum of the red cart always has to equal 0.1 kilogram meters per second. So that tells me that the momentum of the blue card is also negative 0.5 kilogram meters per second, just solving that equation for PB. Now that I know the momentum of the blue card, I just divide by its mass to get the velocity, and so it would be something like negative 1 meter per second, or I should more correctly say 1 meter per second to the left. So the big idea here is that by knowing what the total momentum has to be, if I can find one of the momentums, I can use that to find the second momentum. That's the big idea. That's how we use this rule that momentum is conserved to analyze a um, system. Let's talk briefly about the three different kinds of collisions, because it's kind of important that we be able to classify them. In an elastic collision, elastic kind of means bouncy, um, something called the kinetic energy of the system remains constant. What pray tell is kinetic energy? For right now, it's just this quantity, one-half mv squared. 
we'll understand more about why it's important later on. In an inelastic collision, some of the energy is going to be lost during the collision. And then if the collision is perfectly inelastic, that means that they stick together, so that would be like the first example, and then lots of energy is lost. And again, we'll learn more about this whole energy thing later. For right now, we just need to be able to kind of classify the different kinds of collisions. Um, kinetic energy is measured in a unit called the Joule, named after a guy by the name of James Joule, which has a symbol capital J. And so again, for right now, I don't need you to understand what energy really means. We'll do a whole unit on it. I just need you to be able to classify collisions using um, kinetic energy. So the first example that we did is obviously a perfectly, oops, I should have written inelastic. Hang on, oops. It's a pretty serious typo there. Inelastic. Um, and we know it's perfectly inelastic because they stuck together. So what about the second collision? I can't really classify it without doing a little bit more work. So here's the before picture, and here's the after picture. And then the question is, did this quantity called kinetic energy change? And so all I have to do is just plug and chug, add up the two kinetic energies for the before picture, and that would be something like eight and a half, and then do it for the after picture, which will be 1.6. So the masses didn't change. The only numbers that changed are the velocities. And so when we did that, we went from an energy of 8.5 um, joules to an energy of about 1.6 joules. So that tells me that some kinetic energy was lost, and therefore we should classify that as an inelastic collision. If these two numbers had been the same, we would classify it as a elastic collision. Um, and that means it's more bouncy, basically. Last thing to discuss, and this is another really important big idea, is the idea of center of mass. The center of mass of an object or a system is basically a point within that system that moves as if it were a point particle. So up until now, we've really only ever talked about things assuming that they were like points, perfect um, little tiny spheres. And we've modeled that with like marbles and tennis balls and things like that. But real objects don't really move that way. For instance, if you were to throw a hammer at somebody, it would kind of spin or rotate as it went through the air. But somewhere on the hammer would be a point that moved in a perfect parabola, just like we learned things really move when they move through the air. That point is called the center of mass. Every object has a center of mass, and so if it were to be moving, it would move as if it were a point particle at that point. So that's the importance of the center of mass. So in a system like what we just saw, the importance of the center of mass is that when momentum is conserved in a closed system, the center of mass moves at a constant velocity, even if the objects that make up the system don't. So here's a real common example. Suppose we have a rocket ship that is traveling to the right at 200 meters per second. Somewhere within that system is a point called the center of mass. It would be typically closer towards the larger mass part of the system. So since the front of my rocket ship has got more mass, because uh, I said it does, the center of mass will be located closer towards it. Now when the rocket ship is intact and whole, that dot is moving at 200 meters per second, just like the rest of the rocket ship. But if something were to happen where the rocket ship were to separate it into two pieces, where one goes faster and the other goes slower, that little dot would still be moving at 200 meters per second. and would always be proportionally the same distance between the um, left part of the rocket ship and the right part of the rocket ship. So for example, if it was three quarters of the way between the two, 
then it would always be three quarters of the way between the two. And it would always move at 200 meters per second. Now you may be going, what's the importance of that dot? Later on, that dot is going to allow us to make a lot of problems a lot simpler. And understanding the concept of that dot is going to make rotation a lot simpler. Understanding the hammer, basically. So the hammer is not a closed system. If you were to throw a hammer at somebody because there's an external force on it, the center of mass doesn't move at a constant velocity. So here, since it's a projectile, the center of mass moves in a parabola instead of a straight line. But if the system is closed, like it was with the rocket ship example, then the center of mass moves at a constant speed. That's kind of important. This idea of center of mass is kind of important for a high jumper. Um, somewhere back in the 50s or 60s, if I remember correctly, um, a guy figured out that if you run over the bar and kind of flop over it, you can actually jump over a higher bar. And the reason is because the center of mass, which is the part of your body that moves as a projectile when you jump, actually passes below the bar because you've got a lot of your mass below the bar, even though the point of your body that's going above it is actually above it. And so understanding the idea of center of mass is actually really important in a lot of sports activities, like high jumping um, and swimming, believe it or not. And knowing where your center of mass is is really important for balancing yourself when you swim. It changes your technique. So let's look at another example where that... Um, we'll consider the center of mass. So let's take the same rocket ship kind of example. And let's suppose we've got a rocket ship that's moving at 200 meters per second when it separates into two pieces. A 500 kilogram piece that moves forwards at 300 meters per second and a 250 kilogram piece. And we want to know how fast is the uh, 250 kilogram piece going and how fast is the center of mass going. So to kind of draw a picture, there's our before and our after picture, and we're trying to figure out those two velocities. So the first question we answer using conservation of momentum. I'm going to calculate the momentum of the system. Since it's one object, I can just take those two masses and add them together, and then multiply by that one object's velocity. And that would give me something like 15 or 150 mark, 150,000 marks. When it separates, I can again find the momentum of the piece that I know about. So multiply the mass of the front times 300, and we would get 150,000 marks. And so the two momentums have to add up to be the same as what we found earlier. So this is the important number right here. And as it turns out, when you solve that equation, um, you would get zero. So all the momentum is in the front of the ship, none of it is in the back. And so that thing basically just stopped. So I'm going to erase my arrow, kind of. Now the center of mass, velocity, we have to realize that it's just moving at a constant velocity. Originally it was moving at 200 meters per second, and so after the collision it has to be moving at 200 meters per second. And it's really no trickier than that. You won't be asked to calculate the center of mass. Um, there's you know, fancy equations for it, but we're not going to learn them. I just need you to know and understand that it is constant when the system is closed and momentum is conserved. Okay, a couple of pro tips to help you understand, because systems can get kind of complicated. First thing, always draw a picture of the system before and after um, any collisions, explosions, interactions, etc. If you raise your hand during class and ask a question about a problem involving a system and you have not done that, the only thing I'm going to tell you is do that. The second thing is always define what your system is. If there's multiple objects involved, write down what objects are actually part of your system. And then the third thing is to always keep your variables clear. That's really, really, really super important. Because if you look back at some of these questions we worked with, notice that there are a bunch of different P's for momentums that we used. And so it's really important that you use some sort of system, 
like different subscripts, you know, one versus two, or different colors, like I used orange, red, and purple, I guess, um, in order to keep those straight. So have some system for keeping your variables clear, otherwise you're going to get them messed up. And then our big ideas, in a closed system, the momentum of the system is constant, and the velocity of the center of mass is constant. And then the other big idea is that elastic means kinetic energy is constant. So notice that there's a lot of things that are constant that make up these big ideas. That's the really important thing, is what's staying the same even though there's a really complicated interaction occurring. So that's the end of this video. I think we've done enough. The thing you might think about is how, do what we, how does what we learned here today connect to the two big ideas, uh, three big ideas rather, that we learned as being Newton's laws? Because basically what I did is I just redefined um, two of Newton's three laws. See if you could kind of see that connection, and we'll talk about that in class next time. Till then, ta-ta.